Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another informative webinar um, hosted by NERDIC, the New England uh, uh, Regional Defense Industry Collaboration, um, and hosted by the Connecticut Center for Advanced Technology and all of our partners. Um, certainly a bunch of them you're going to hear from today, the, the MEPs, the Manufacturing Extension Programs. Um, you're going to hear about their different technology providers and partners around the region. So another great webinar. Today we're focusing on benchmarking 3D printed parts um, manufactured with desktop metal studio systems. So, you know, there's a lot going on in the additive space, tremendous number of technologies uh, and capabilities. And we're going to hear from a really strong team today. So um, I'm going to be introducing on later on just Pat Giovara, who's with the Manufacturing um, Extension Center in Vermont. We have Steve Longfrey, Operations Manager from the Berkshire Innovation Center, Gene Mozelik, the founder of the Mozolik Group, and Mark Rowan, um, principal of Roundabout Consulting. So a great group. And of course, you're going to hear from some of the technical providers at CCAT. So, you know, we have a full agenda today, a really great program. So, you know, as we move through the program, I want to bring on Patricia Giovara. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Actually, I need to go into the ecosystem a little bit. I forgot to touch it. And Pat, you stay right on there right now, because okay. this is about, you know, this is something the, the, the defense industry collaboration has been around now for a while. And and the MEPs have been absolutely instrumental and in working together throughout the region. So now as we look at this ecosystem, what's developed, we're looking at bringing in entities like the technical centers and the PTAPs in, the educational centers, really convening industry. So um, this whole Nerdic uh, approach and the initiative uh, and, and really a tremendous effort by the steering committee and future IQ pulling this together is really going to have kind of a long lasting sustainable platform that we're building. But Patricia, on your end, when, when you look at all the activities that you guys have been focusing on, um, not just in Vermont, but really all, all your questions, you know, we've had a lot of webinars now and we've got a bunch more um, and so much valuable information. So I just wanted you to talk a little bit about that. And then, you know, really these tremendous demonstration projects and other things that are so valuable that are free to, to, to manufacturers. How do, we, how do we present it and get them to get a little more engaged on these? Hi, Ron. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, there's a, a, a lot that you kind of covered in that uh, quick intro. And um, first of all, yes, the, the MEP centers and other partners and the economic development partners across New England have been working on this Nerdic initiative now for a few years. Um, and in particular, focused on um, cybersecurity as one of the key, you know, it's really one of those backbone you know, on that diagram that you showed of industry 4.0 technologies, right? It's a kind of a key in underpinning, if you will, to be able to uh, protect all of this information and IP as we uh, work on some of these digital thread and you know other technologies that that we're uh, talking about here um and again thank you for having me i am from vmac and uh you can see the logos of the other new england meps uh showing up here um one of the roles that uh we're uh, uh playing i guess you would say here is as this um as we go through these um webinars that 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 CCAD is uh, leading here on some of these industry 4.0 technologies is you know, making connections with the manufacturers throughout New England. And you mentioned the demo projects and it's just, this is the opportunity, like you said, at no cost for manufacturers, even, I mean, they can be very small uh, contributors to the defense supply chain, right? So they don't have to be, and we're looking for small and medium-sized manufacturers that have some part of their business in defense supply chain to participate and, you know, really kind of get a hands-on feel for some of these different uh, technologies. So the first week um, of this series, we talked about artificial intelligence and uh, some video training, and then the next was around augmented reality. Um, so I know that uh, uh, different companies have signed up to be part of those demo projects. And we're, we're on week three, I think it is now, of uh, four weeks of different additive manufacturing technologies. And there's opportunity for six uh, companies uh, from across New England to participate in demonstration projects. And specifically what's, what this means is, if you have a part that you would like to submit that you're currently manufacturing with, with some, some process, 
um, that can be um, submitted to be um, have the design optimized for additive manufacturing and then actually have that part printed. So there's no cost to participate in this. You know, if you've got a part that maybe would benefit from light weighting or would benefit from reduced cost or being able to reduce the number of manufacturing steps or the number of components, um, please do consider submitting that. And the um, CCAT can, can you know, be a, you know, apply on the CCAT website. Um, you can talk to your MEP. Um, field staff or project manager if you have questions and you know we can help you with the application process so just really want to encourage that participation yeah uh, Patricia thank you I mean you talk about so many important things I mean you started out uh, when, when you first started speaking even about the MEPs engaged in cyber um, and you know we're talking about a very holistic approach to, to what we're trying to do with the defense um, community and, and, and those supply chain because it's about a very robust IT infrastructure. Um, it's about the data collection, IoT, and of course, all the CMMC requirements. And we talk about those things, and, and those are requirements. I mean, CMMC and the work that you guys are doing is really you know, kind of high level stuff for these companies. But additive is one of those things that it's, it, it can be complex, but you know, when we hear from Steve, we, we understand there's a whole host of ways that they can be looking at this for tooling and fixturing and understand and you know from your take you guys go in and out of these companies um you know is, is it just the companies maybe don't understand it as much are they are they you know nervous about it uh they just don't understand additive what's do you what do you think is some are could be one of the main issues about getting companies engaged in, in additive right um well you you touched on on some there um and, and i do know there are many uh companies that are maybe starting to use additive to uh, build tooling as you mentioned right jigs or fixtures that they might use in the manufacturing process um you know others are getting into product but not so much one of the um barriers I think is the cost. Um, so for example, we're talking about metals additive and powder bed fusion, and these are very expensive um, machines. Um, so herein is some of the opportunity and benefit of this network that we're talking about, right? And and having you know the University of Maine will hear from next week and their metals additive technology. Vermont Tech is putting in some metals um, additive, uh, um, Berkshire Innovation Center, CCAT, and others, right? So this is where, uh, you know, there's not a single piece of this uh, manufacturing ecosystem that we can kind of like break apart. It's all important. Um, and overcoming this, this um, uh, barrier of the cost of entry for manufacturing quality to be able to get started um, with some of these metal parts. I think that is a barrier. And, and through this collective, we are helping um, manufacturers in New England overcome that barrier. So that's one of the really exciting things about what we're talking about you know, today and next week and you know, through the Nerdic program. Yeah, those are great points. I mean, overcoming uh, those barriers and, and really these demonstration projects to be able to show a company what can be done and the efficiencies and the value around it. Uh, you, you just don't have this opportunity uh, very often. So, you know, let's hope we can capitalize that, invite more companies um, to engage in these demonstration projects. It's simple uh, to do and it doesn't require a lot of lift on their part, uh, but it, it will be a great journey. Uh, with some great technical resources from around the region. So thank you very much, Patricia, for, for joining us. It was great hearing from you and look forward to seeing you again shortly. Thanks, Ron. So now at this time, I'd like to introduce Steve Longpre. Steve is gonna uh, give us kind of a great introduction um, into some of the um, desktop metal uh, technology and uh, as just a great program. He'll be introducing Gene and Mark, as you see on the slide, um, as he goes through for, for the longer part of the presentation, but tremendous amount of great info. Um, and and I, th I think is what Patricia said, it's just about a learning process, getting that introduction. And this is a great way um, to kind of begin that. So uh, let's see, Steve, um, just waiting to see you get, uh, see you pull yourself up on this. And then we can uh, kind of begin, there we go. 
Um, so Steve, I guess we'll hand it off to you now, just to make sure the guys from the audience, um, everything Steve's going over, this will all be available in handout form uh, that will be sent to you. And also you can put in any questions uh, into the chat room and we'll be fielding all those later. So Steve, uh, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Patricia. So my name is Steve Lockbury. I'm the uh, operations manager for the Berkshire Innovation Center. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, benchmarking uh, a 3D printing system developed by Desktop Metal, the Studio 2 system, and how it can be used in defense supply and what are some of the variables uh, to be expected when uh, looking at producing parts that require a specific uh, set of uh, specifications or, or quality control um, and how we're going about doing that. Next. A little bit about the Berkshire Innovation Center first. Uh, the Berkshire Innovation Center is uh, a $14 million uh, state-funded facility here in Pittsfield in the heart of the Berkshires. Uh, we are a member-driven uh, organization with over 25 member uh, companies and academic uh, affiliates that are uh, using the BIC and the capabilities here to develop workforce training in the manufacturing fields that are central to the Berkshires. Uh, fields like uh, wire harnessing, uh, defense applications with companies like General Dynamics and Glencore Armored Vehicles, uh, uh, plastics injection molding, uh, non-woven textiles production, uh, and a variety of other supporting manufacturing operations. Um, there's quite a bit of uh, capability here at the BIC. Uh, next. Mostly focused at this point around core manufacturing in the additive manufacturing uh, technologies and also metrology equipment. We have everything from desktop metal level tech uh, through stereolithographic uh, technology, uh, carbon uh, fiber composite 3D printing capabilities, polyjet capabilities, uh, large format additive manufacturing capabilities uh, through Big Rep uh, USA, and also uh, the newly installed desktop metal system. And our metrology capabilities come from uh, some mass development grant funds uh, that were used to purchase a, a hexagon global and hexagon uh, roamer uh, portable metrology systems. Next. We also are the recipient of a mass development uh, collaborative workspaces grant, which we've used to begin outfitting a, an advanced augmented reality and virtual reality suite uh, that will enable members and companies throughout the region, companies throughout uh, the, the Nordic uh, region to develop uh, training applications uh, experimental uh, research applications into uses for augmented uh, and virtual reality, as well as ways to digitize their facilities or digitize uh, digital assets, uh, 3D scanning, that they can use to develop, uh, again, more applications that are supporting our, our warfighter. Next. We also have conferencing, media, and event spaces that are available both to members and to the public. Uh, as well as wet labs for uh, companies that are looking to explore uh, applications in, uh, petro in uh, plastics chemical formulation uh, or, or other uh, applications that we touch upon. Next. So a little bit of background on, on myself. In addition to the operations uh, of the BIC, I'm also an innovator in rep residence here. Uh, my background stems from some work that we did at CCAT uh, back in 2017, where we explored material salvage and conversion, uh, where we were manufacturing metal powders from uh, machine shop wastes directly into those powders using a, a mechanical grinding technology, as opposed to melt atomization processes. That led to some work uh, with the NSF i program and some uh, intern partnership programs with Mass Tech, we trained some students in developing scaling applications for these materials, and that eventually led to a cooperative R&D agreement with the U.S. Navy to explore the art of possible in, in a field called expeditionary additive manufacturing. How do we deploy these types of systems in the field to support our, our soldiers? Next. Now I'm going to introduce Gene Mazzolik, the founder and president of the Mazzolik Group. Yeah, there I am. Well, good afternoon. Thanks, Steve, for the introduction. Um, I'm the founder and president of the Mazzolik Group, but I have a little bit about my background. I have a bachelor's and master's degree in material science from MIT. I have a 45-year career in the thermal spray industry. 
and I've held positions in some of the key players in that space, including Praxair, um, now Orlicon Metco and HC Stark. As a result of those 45 years, I have expertise in the thermal spray world, many industries, primarily aerospace, defense, automotive, chemical, and energy. In 2006, I founded the Mazzola Group uh, with a focus on thermal spray, cold spray, and powder metallurgy solutions. Uh, my activities primarily include market analysis, business development, business diversification and expansion, as well as some sales activities. Uh, some select uh, project activities have been sputtering target repair, utilizing cold spray, and recently contracted by the DOD to provide a market analysis on thermal spray, cold spray, and additive manufacturing powders in support of our warfighter for field repair. This um, uh, photo here just shows a cold spray repair of a magnesium gear, and that is courtesy of ASB Industries. Next. Now, how do I support uh, Nerdic uh, through BIC and BSS Additive? Primarily, I'm, I'm collaborating with, with Steve um, on powder metallurgy, recycling and reuse, as well as evaluation of cold spray as an additive manufacturing process. Uh, my background, I do have experience in the recycling and reuse of powders, uh, particularly managing hexavalent chrome waste, which is a known carcinogen uh, from chrome oxide uh, that was used in the printing industry. Also, the reuse and recapture of tungsten and cobalt units from hard metal scrap. Cold spray right now is of growing interest to the DOD for repair and is considered an additive manufacturing process. I put the schematic on this slide uh, to the right, um, tungsten carbide cobalt. And this is how critical benchmarking really is in this aspect of materials. All of these are the same chemistry, but as you can see, they're uniquely different from one another and that, that can result in different processing parameters and, and different um, you know, functional results in, in the environment. So it's extremely critical to know what, what you're putting into any of these systems. That's a little bit about me. So I think I'll turn it over to Mark. Thank you, Jean. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks, Steve and Jean, and thanks to uh, Nerdic for having us here at this event. I, I would say I am um, more of a fan of additive manufacturing than an expert, uh, but I have a background in design engineering, and I'm starting in pro audio gear and moving then into consumer electronics. And with consumer electronics, that's where I got my education in mass production and traditional manufacturing practices. But we adopted 3D printing very early as a, 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 more than 15 years ago, I bought my first uh, large scale 3D printer to support engineering verification and sales samples. And we found that we were able to make uh, very good, very useful models but we knew we were quite a ways away from a production capability. Uh, my uh, interest in recent years uh, is uh, looking at the possibility of, of tooling through additive manufacturing as a design engineer. I think the time factor, uh, the improvements in time to market that you'd see with that have been uh, intriguing to me. And as I move more into an operational role, uh, the idea of using additive manufacturing for inventory flexibility uh, became uh, of, of interest to me, of uh, what we were hoping to see the industry evolve to. A lot of the work that I did was based on uh, third-party accessories for mobile devices. So every time Apple or Samsung change their devices, which you know they do, uh, every year, uh, all of our inventory would be at risk and it made our projections much more difficult. Or if a customer came to us asking, you know, would we support a an LG device or some other device that wasn't Apple or Samsung, uh, I could see that those conversations uh, became a lot easier uh, to get speculative and attack markets that way with the flexibility that additive manufacturing would bring to us at some point and kind of that 
shared interest and enthusiasm is what led me to uh, to meet Steve. And we've been looking at this industry and uh, potential commercialization uh, for the past couple of years. Thank you, Mark. So um, why benchmarking? Uh, what's, what's important about uh, establishing benchmarks? Well, it helps us understand whether or not an, app, an application can work and how repeatable it can be. Uh, will it improve processes that we currently use? Uh, and uh, very importantly, can it be more cost effective? Uh, the DOD is very, very focused on cost um, because every dollar that's spent off the field doesn't necessarily directly impact uh, the, the person fighting the battle. Um, so we need to be aware of, of how to how to create the best opportunities, the best technology, because uh, that ultimately is what's going to save the lives of our soldiers. Um, need for reliable metrics in production and planning. Um, how does benchmarking apply not just to, to a physical product, but to the process by which that product is manufactured, the whole organization that, that is, is responsible for scaling it? These are all parts of, of the benchmarking process. And it's important to ask these questions because how will they apply to Industry 4.0 in years to come as the U.S. Uh, general manufacturing base adopts these new technologies and those feed into the DoD? Uh, examples, uh, will AI mine these kinds of uh, manufacturing data to optimize our supply chains, to make choices uh, or, or assist in, in making choices uh, based on the performance metrics that we can generate uh, through the, the type of work that we're looking at doing here uh, today. Next. And, and where would we find some of this information? So there are, there are groups that are uh, actively pursuing this. Uh, Senval uh, would be uh, a place that I'd, I'd refer people to go to and to look for more information. They are uh, amassing quite a bit of information on the capabilities of all the uh, additive manufacturing technologies and all the materials that are currently being manufactured. And, and quite, quite interesting is the, the fact that most of the AM processes are proprietary. They're uh, partnership-based, where a material supplier uh, partners with a, an equipment supplier, and, and they create a, a very simple path uh, to validation and certification of, of materials and performance metrics. But what happens when we start to change that? What happens if somebody needs to be able to use a material that's not spec for a specific machine, uh, or use a machine in a way that's never been, been quite attempted before? How do we get that, that information out to the manufacturers, to, to the people in the field that are actually gonna deploy these, these uh, technologies? Or, or the, the end user, uh, whether it's somebody at a machine shop level or somebody somebody uh, on the battlefield. Uh, these are important things for us to, 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 to measure and benchmark. Next. So why we purchased a desktop metal studio machine? It was uh, a cost decision, but also because we were really looking at ways to bridge into training, workforce training in an effective uh, manner without all the barriers that uh, seem to come with more advanced technologies like laser powder bed fusion or binder jetting, especially from a materials handling perspective. Um, we wanted to test bound metal deposition, BMD capabilities, to understand how they could fit in our regional uh, manufacturing uh, landscape. What were the materials capable of? What are the operating requirements and software capable of doing? Uh, we looked at case studies in real world environments and a lot of them matched with our, our membership. We also were interested in the expeditionary applications and what is the definition of an office? Desktop Metal promotes their machine as office friendly. Well, can office mean a, a studio office like we have here perhaps? Or are we looking at a, a shipping container that's been converted into a, a Ford deployable manufacturing center like the, machine, the Marines and the Army have been doing? Or are we looking at off-world applications, even in, in the not-so-distant future, where something like this technology could be uh, brought to the moon or Mars? Next. We also were looking at uh, R&D value and total cost of ownership experience. How do you actually uh, buy a car to test drive it? Well, you can go and, and try it out, have a part printed or two, but until you really understand what it takes to install a machine like this, you, you really can't talk about it. So we took a look at a uh, used desktop metal machine to understand uh, what the requirements were for maintenance, for equipment space, uh, what the repair cost might be. We want to understand what production and scaling op opportunities exist. And, and what exactly are these new materials that desktop metal is discussing? No debind materials, things that no longer require an intermediate stage to process them. It can go right from a printer 
right into a sintering furnace, and now you have a fully dense part that you can put into potentially uh, an, op an application. These are all things that we wanted to understand better, so, uh, so that's why we purchased this machine. Next. We also learned in the process how to prepare a facility, uh, ventilation, electrical floor, and, and fire ratings, process gas and feedstock waste requirements, security applications. Uh, Patricia talked about cybersecurity being a, a very large concern. How exactly can these types of systems integrate into operations, especially in defense supply? So benchmarking is, is a lot more than just the end use product that we're trying to measure, but the whole process of integrating a new technology into, a, into an operation. Because we're member-based, we want to be able to advise our members. And again, within the Nerdic community, we want to be able to do the same, advise uh, companies that are interested in adopting or exploring the adoption of new, these new technologies on what it's going to take to actually implement them. Um, some distinct advantages of bound metal deposition compared with powder bed, you don't have to worry about handling potentially explosive materials. Uh, wastes are, are considerably less. Um, and it's fairly easy to train for this type of technology because most colleges and high schools now are even teaching uh, FDM level uh, applications, uh, which are very similar to this technology. Next. And so we also explored with our, with our members uh, planned applications, things like uh, conformally cooled injection and thermoform molds, because we have a large number of, of injection molders in the region, heat exchangers, more efficient ways to chill things or improve tool cooling, laser and lighting applications, medical devices, tools and guides. These again are all examples of ways we can measure or metric how this particular piece of equipment and the materials that come with it can perform. And looking for ways to, to teach this technology. Uh, we, we'd like to be able to teach rocket science level technology. Well, how about if we start with bike parts as an example so that we can move into the discussion of vehicle light weighting as a method for, for education and training. Next. And can this machine be used as a materials development platform? Um, can we compact powder, uh, which is a, a compact powder metallurgy, is a well understood process, extrusion uh, 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 refinement. Can we do the same thing with, with pressed metals? And, and this is an example, this photo of uh, what appears to be a pencil lead, that's the filament stick that goes within inside the, the desktop metal system. It's a die press extrusion method of manufacturing. Can we use uh, this type of a platform to start to refine the materials uh, palette, to, to understand how to improve and, and create new materials? Again, things like uh, uh, tungsten uh, uh, tooling or, or extruded coppers and things like that that could go into material uh, systems like this as a prelude to training for more complex uh, technologies that desktop and other companies offer like single pass binder jetting or laser powder bed fusion. Can we use this tool as a, as a platform for, for research and development? Next. And then we get back to defense applications. What is possible? So I was, I was uh, tasked with, with exploring the fringes of what's possible with, with these emerging technologies especially. And in defense and R&D applications, we immediately saw some applications for durable parts, for things like new 3D printers, um, ceramic extrusion, how do you make hardened extrusion nozzles, uh, things like concrete fabrication as an example. Uh, Multi-materials, can you apply a material coating to a, a 3D bound metal part once it's centered? Can you create new tools for, for additional fabrication? Applications in defense injection molding, again, improving the performance of molds, uh, benchmarking those performance to be able to understand whether the, the energy used is a, a net cost savings for both the, the manufacturer that's supplying, but also the, the government that's purchasing. Um, IED and uh, unexploded, uh, unexploded ordnance and, and improvised explosive device disposable applications. Uh, Naval Service Warfare Center in, in Maryland is tasked with exploring ways to uh, equip our, 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 uh, our warfighters with ways to, to disarm things in, in the field, things like landmines or uh, uh, found munitions. How can perhaps forward deployed desktop metal systems be used to improve those tools that they have at, at their disposal. Um, and then if we start to look at disposal applications, we also have to do some threat assessment, understand whether or not systems like this pose a threat. Can we improve munition performance? Or somebody, can somebody improve munition performance with this? Uh, an example being explosively shaped penetrators, which we know that uh, foreign actors have often supplied uh, to, to 
opponents in the field, well, can we assess uh, our capability to, um, to increase threat uh, response with our own capabilities? And then also looking at things like uh, suitability for uh, microsat applications, aerospace parts, uh, rocket uh, supplied to either NASA or private launch providers and primes. What exactly can this, te this technology achieve? Those are benchmarks. Next. And the BIC has a number of mem uh, member companies that are directly su uh, supplying to the DOD or involved in the, the supply chain. Companies obviously like General Dynamics, who's got very long standing contracts uh, to supply large systems like submarines and land vehicles. Uh, Dive Technologies, a company in, in Massachusetts that manufactures autonomous underwater vehicles that they hope can someday uh, be deployed to service the, the offshore wind turbine and energy industries. Electromagnetic Applications, a company that's hosted here at the BIC uh, that's developing space environment testing chambers uh, so that they can test materials that we might someday develop uh, or other partners within the region can develop that it's a lot cheaper to test in a, in a simulated environment than putting it into a satellite uh, right off. Um, and then companies like Lenco Armored Vehicles, who manufactures uh, hardened uh, armor-plated vehicles for Homeland Security, uh, the Marine Corps, and, and governments that we're friendly, friendly with worldwide. Uh, and then Silicon Plastics uh, and uh, United Aircraft Technologies, who are manufacturing uh, injection-molded uh, wire harnessing systems that are interactive and, and, and virtually uh, accessible uh, to help maintenance crews better service aircraft uh, that that uh, serve our, our defense department. Next. So another measure of benchmarking, can bound metal deposition parts meet mill spec? So how are we gonna find that out if we don't actually attempt to make some parts? Uh, so this is a, a good reason and a good uh, interlude into to what Patricia was asking for. We need some uh, companies that, that have an interest, that have a, a question that, that could be answered uh, to, to, to contact us and try to figure out whether or not uh, a project could meet in, meet a, uh, be, be served by some of our, our capabilities as a, as a nerdic group. Um, so the Marine Corps, as an example, has for a number of years been testing uh, both polymer and off, uh, off, off base service parts in the supply chain to repair the M1 tank in its variations. Uh, can we likewise help companies like General Dynamics, for example, uh, Tactical and Ordnance up in, in uh, Burlington, Vermont, start to explore pathways for using bound metal uh, deposition or any number of, of additive manufacturing capabilities that the Marine Corps is already vetting uh, as a, appropriate tools for field-based supply and, and repair. How do we help develop the, the benchmarks that can, that can pave that supply chain forward? Uh, that's a question that we wanted to answer, ask. Next. And again, if we're gonna teach those high tier technologies, we wanna to start to look at education and workforce development at a lower level, the vocation schools and high schools and college level. We started exploring applications for uh, emerging tooling, repair tooling for out of production tools like uh, Delta wood planers is, is a simple example, using the MakerBot uh, uh, technology that Stratasys is currently developing. Um, can we teach tool builders uh, to build innovative tools to service out of production uh, technologies. Well, that's that's the industrial supply chain worldwide. Uh, lots and lots of equipment that needs to be repaired and maintained. How do we measure or metric that that performance and the development of those parts, and then learn how how to teach that more efficiently? That too is benchmarking. Next. And so. What I thought was, you know, in the process of trying to understand this, it might be helpful to look at how hobbyists are learning to benchmark. Because when we start talking about uh, education and, and workforce development and the rapid growth of, of 3D printing, especially during the COVID uh, pandemic, one of the things we saw was the use of uh, hobby level 3D printers to print everything from uh, COVID masks to, to uh, face shields to a variety of uh, new ways to produce PPE. I, I, we were inundated here at the BIC by requests for more information, by demonstrations. Uh, I'm sure everybody's seen webinars and, and promotions about 3D printed uh, uh, face masks. It's just, it was astounding. Well, those hobbyists that are participating in that makerspace realm, uh, they're the engineers of tomorrow. And they're already actively benchmarking. As a matter of fact, if you think about it, they have downloaded something called a Benchy, 
and, and anybody that's in the 3D printing probably has one. We have one here. Um, this little file uh, has been downloaded and, and produced over 2 million times. Now think about that. That's an enormous amount of data. And, and most of those folks that have gone out and done this at a hobby level have fed the discussion on how to benchmark and test the capabilities of common hobby level 3D printers, light industrial 3D printers, at a very, very high level. Uh, torturing their machines to produce very, very complex uh, uh, shapes and, and objects that test the dimensional uh, accuracy and, and alignment and, and flow parameters uh, capabilities of these machines in polymer space. But also researchers are noticing and they're starting to look at how they can use the same benchmarks. For example, with this teeny tiny two, 20 micron version of a benchy uh, in the more advanced technologies. So that's important. Uh, it's a good place to start. It's a good place to start learning and, and teaching from and also make some observations. Uh, and you've noticed that this is a Creative Commons file and there's their internet site for 3D Benchy. It's not secure. So that poses some questions again on the cybersecurity level that we should address. Next. And especially what we can learn from them. And I found this to be kind of humorous um, because again, if we're going to be talking about 3D printing things, uh, and testing those benchmarks. Well, we could we could be like these these guys. They look like they're having a lot of fun. Uh, they've all got personal flotation devices on. That's good. Hopefully, they don't lose an oar. Uh, but that's one approach, the hobbyist uh, enthusiast approach. But then there's an entirely different approach. And, I, and this other photo here is of the 3D printed boat that the University of Maine was uh, able to to participate in the development of. That's another standard, a whole level of different standards. And how do we help the hobbyist, the enthusiast understand that the work that they're already kind of dabbling at has a real strong place in, in the manufacturing uh, future, the landscape of defense manufacturing in the, in the future? Well, that's a, a great place to start, I think, in some of these conversations. Next. And so, because this is more of a top-down, not super technical discussion, we wanted to talk about how benchmarking has been applied uh, to start off and understand where we're, where we're focused at. Benchmarking and subtractive machining has been around for about 100 plus years. And it uses a very simple artifact, a very simple uh, pattern to test that, called the circle diamond square pattern. And it, what it can do is it can help uh, Companies measure the performance not only of their, their equipment, whether it's a, a shop mill or a lathe or a very advanced multi-axis uh, CNC machine. It, it can help understand the, the performance metrics of the operation in general. Can it be repeatable uh, in, a, in an application? And it can also help gauge and, and benchmark the performance of the, the operator uh, because you can use it as a training tool. In additive manufacturing, especially for, for powder bed processes, laser powder bed fusion is the predominant process that's been adopted by the DOD uh, and its manufacturers currently. Well, they looked at a similar approach called a NIST artifact. Next. And over a number of years, this standard is becoming an, an applied standard for that technology. Uh, uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology in uh, cooperation with uh, ASTM evolving a standard called F42 uh, is looking at how to fit this kind of uh, design as a machine benchmarking standard uh, and it's still emerging this work is not not complete but by using this this downloadable file um, machine operators of high-end laser laser fusion machines and other machines can start to understand how to measure the performance of, of of their systems and their processes. Next. And researchers, in an effort to, to more focus that approach, have started to reiterate that, uh, that NIST artifact into all sorts of different uh, applications. Some of them very, very complex, as, as you can see in, in this lower picture where there are curly cues that are hollow. That would represent something that we would be interested in, for example, with applications for conformal cooling, where we might pump uh, coolant through a, a system to better chill a mold or improve the thermal performance of, a, of a, a chiller or some sort of heat exchanger. But on the other side, there, there are uh, test coupon benchmarks. There are uh, very tiny benchmarks that you can print multiple of them on a uh, within a build surface. These are all attempts at creating uh, commercialization roadmaps 
to testing and certifying uh, the capabilities of machines and their operators and their materials. Uh, and so we, we dug deep into this to understand a little bit about the existing work and, and what they're trying to, to measure. Next. And we're using that in conjunction with the, the recommendations from the equipment supplier, uh, Desktop Metal, who has created the design guide uh, to optimize and, and redesign the NIST test artifacts so that it'll fit within the parameters of the Desktop Metal 2 system. Now, this is ongoing work. We don't actually have uh, printed samples at this point. We're in the design phase. We an enormous amount of information that we're, we're looking at. But the goal would be to take this benchmarking uh, next step and apply it at the same time, perhaps, that we're doing a generative design project with one of the companies that might want to do a demo project. Because at the same time as we're printing a part, we can also be gaining some material fingerprinting, some material performance uh, uh, data. Uh, on what's actually going on with that machine by printing a test coupon or an artifact, a, a benchmark. And, and as we duplicate that process more and more, if that artifact is small enough, but it can generate enough information, well, we can, we can start benchmarking and understanding not only the performance of the machine, but the performance of differing materials, and eventually even the performance of the operators involved or the environment in which those printers are, are, are hosted. And that can start to be something of a, of a resource that other researchers, other manufacturers can use. And as a Nordic defense organization, if that information is available to everybody, that would be very useful. Next. And again, placement methodologies. How would we use this to help predict and, and correct, potentially, the performance of the machines that we all operate? This is a crucial part when you look at very complex uh, laser additive or even uh, bound metal centered uh, processes, binder jetting processes. How do these machines perform and how do we predict ways to correct, uh, correct them when they're going wrong? Next. And what we found out early on by working with Hexagon uh, Global uh, is that there's an enormous amount of data that you can generate from these, these, uh, these test samples. Uh, this is a, a, an actual scan using one of their structured life scanners. Uh, they, they did this uh, while, while they were down at AMUG this year, um, and they were able to generate a heat map uh, to show variance in, in the, the sample that we sent them. Uh, to the STL file itself. So comparisonable depth benchmarks. It's another area that, uh, that we're looking at focusing. Next. And why, again, is this important? To encourage participation within the NIST uh, ASTM uh, adoption process, to establish standards across many different types of machines, similar or dissimilar, to understand what the capabilities of the desktop metal machine are, where bound metal deposition can enclose lattices within uh, shells where uh, other processes require drainage holes. This is a unique feature and it might offer some unique benefits and some limitations, obviously, but these are all applications that we're gonna explore here, measure and benchmark so that we understand where they fit within the defense uh, landscape and how they best can serve our, our service people. Next. And within the community itself, again, we're gonna hopefully be able to, to generate some additional data so that we can, as a group, better understand the capabilities within our region. Um, I thought this was a useful picture. For those that recognize it, this was the, the large container ship that, that got caught or stuck in the, the Suez Canal. What we wanna do is we wanna, be, we wanna understand what data is available and, and how data is being used within both the defense community, but also in general manufacturing. And, and how do we gauge that, that uh, performance data, that, those metrics, to do things like counterfeit detection? Within the art of possible for uh, expeditionary added manufacturing and powder metallurgy uh, in the way that we were de developing it, we started realizing that those materials could potentially uh, uh, enter or re-enter the supply chain uh, in ways that somebody might not be able to, to anticipate. And as Gene illustrated, three different uh, uh, morphologies of powders with all the same chemistry produce dramatically different results. How can we utilize uh, some of these these uh, data streams to, to help offset some potential threats to defense and general supply? Next. And this is the reason why. We spent $200,000 on, on a 3D printer, uh, but you can go out and you can buy one for $10,000, uh, including a centering station, a small ceramic oven. And while that might be good for you know things like uh, art, arts purposes, it's still pretty interesting that this is emerging more and more materials every day. Everything from 
different ceramics to uh, titanium uh, alloys, uh, tungsten carbide for tooling, metals like copper and, and inconel. These are all capable of being produced with a $10,000 machine. Next. For a little bit more money, uh, you can actually use a MakerBot now in the classroom to produce uh, 316 stainless steel composites that can then be shipped out to, uh, to contractors who will center them into solid steel parts. And this is a recent uh, addition to, to MakerBot. Next. And what if you take that same filament and put it in a very large machine like our, our Big Rep? You can make many, many objects uh, of, of small size, approximately four or five inches, or the size of a, of a benchy that could then be centered into, into a fully dense part. Next. And then the onset of lower cost, uh, selective laser melting or uh, laser powder bed fusion type systems, binder jet jetting systems or material jetting systems. There's a whole slew of new technologies that are emerging every day. It's very difficult to track all of this stuff. Well, what does that do to the supply chain and how's it gonna impact uh, our war fighters? Next. Well, here's the question. When we do threat assessment as part of a defense initiative, we want to understand what are all the variables. And there's been a lot of discussion over the years uh, about 3D printing of guns. The things that bother me a little bit more are what happens when those uh, 3D prints can be something like a, a shaped penetrator that can be disguised uh, in, in a way that you, you might not anticipate. These are, are questions that have to be answered. And we do this, again, through the benchmarking process to understand, well, if we can do that here, what could somebody else do that do in the field? Next. And unfortunately, we, you know, this is relevant because when I was assembling the slides a, a week or two ago, uh, we had yet to see what was going on over in the Middle East. Uh, but I find it relevant because uh, it, it was eye-opening. Over 1,900 uh, missiles have since fallen uh, on Israel from the Gaza Strip. That means that somebody had to disassemble, design, manufacture, disassemble, transport, reassemble, stage, and launch them in a repeated fashion. Well, what happens if those are 3D printers someday? Um, they could produce many times more potentially devastating uh, armaments, especially when we start looking at things like drones that can be improvised to carry things like uh, grenades and, and small submunitions that you can't track with, with uh, anti-missile technologies uh, like the Israelis or like we have. So these are all questions that have, have relevance to the benchmarking process for basic technologies like we have here. Next. And then understanding what the metrics are for improving security with new technologies. So a team recently from the University of Buffalo uh, found that they could actually measure a fingerprint of a, of a 3D printer uh, by monitoring its thermal extrusion profile and that every single solitary print had some degree of variance. This is an, 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 what's called an anisotropic process. It's not always the same. So those variances have a, an interesting uh, uh, signature that can be highly accurate in identifying the type of 3D printer uh, and possibly even the actual 3D printer that printed something. So measuring those things, again, is a benchmark that might prove useful in years to come from a forensics perspective. Next. And ultimately, this all comes back down to expanding capabilities. How can what we're working on here with our partners through Nerdic uh, be used to help establish a higher capability that protects and serves uh, the folks that, that serve and protect us uh, worldwide? Next. So again, I'd like to encourage you to reach out through Nerdic if you have some interest in uh, pilot demonstrations. We have a large number of uh, types of technologies here at the BIC, uh, and combined with our partners throughout uh, the New England region, uh, we would love to see uh, involvement from companies uh, so that we can help uh, demonstrate new applications that might uh, some way, someday lead to, lead to a better world. Next. Next. Thank you. All right. There we go, Jeff. I was looking for you, Jeff. I was going to pop back on because I was looking for you. <laughs> I don't know if we got our timing wrong. Steve, that was amazing. Steve, I, I, mm -hmm. I think Steve might be staying on. Um, if you'll pop back on, we do have some question and answer now. Mm -hmm. and. Um, 
uh, just folks for you on the on this webinar. This is Jeff Crandall. He's our additive um, manufacturing manager at CCAT. He's been in the additive space for probably about a decade now, um, a phenomenal resource. And um, Jeff, I know you're going to bring Steve. You're going to introduce some of the other folks here and have a bit of question and answer. So mm -hmm. we'll turn it over to you. All right. Uh, we encourage you, if you have questions, to please uh, pop them in the question section on the uh, right-hand side of the screen. And we do have a number of questions already. So, um, Steve, I think this is more directed to you. And I think you may have answered it in the presentation. But do you foresee a potential intersection between the powders from the BSS additive project? And you might want to read talk what those are, uh, and the raw material used in uh, BMD, uh, bound metal deposition. What are the challenges in getting something like that done? That's a great question, Jeff. Uh, yeah, I do believe that there's there's an application uh, for them. Um, what we were able to do uh, in the work that we, we did with CCAT was demonstrate a, a method for taking machine shop waste chips, uh, grinding them directly into a, a, a range of different powders, uh, different sizes and, 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 and powder morphologies, uh, and then put them into directed uh, uh, laser metal systems as well as powder bed systems to test and, and understand whether or not they could be assembled. And, and we did see that they, they were useful. I think that um, the roadmap for doing something like that with, uh, with uh, BMD technology is obviously to engage with desktop metal first, and we've, we've started that conversation, at least at a very high level, uh, but also to understand, again, that, that uh, side angle, can somebody do this without approaching desktop metal? How difficult would that be? And I think that, um, that again, we would like to understand whether or not the, the desktop metal system can be used in this way. Uh, the recent uh, changes to their, their cartridge loading, they now ship parts or, or uh, filament sticks as a, as a bulk cartridge or as a, as a refill. Uh, that opens up an avenue for that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think it, I think there's a, a very high probability that we could go down that path with them. Okay, uh, you've recently uh, made a lot of uh, equipment additions, which you talked about in your presentation. So um, if you could think about maybe the top, you know, one, two, three lessons learned that you could pass on to people that are interested in adopting, in particular, let's say metal uh, machines. Sure. Uh, do some research first. Uh, go out and find somebody that has one. Ask them to uh, to print some parts. Show you the process by which uh, you, you can you can have some parts manufactured. What are the challenges uh, in, in hosting a system like that? Um, we worked closely with the University of Massachusetts as well as CCAT to understand uh, applications for lens and for uh, DMLS as well as the EOS powder bed uh, uh, systems. We looked at um, applications for for wire extrusion technologies. Uh, we, we, you have to do your homework first. Uh, and then once you understand that, that these machines all perform differently, choose something within a budget. Uh, planning is a, is a big, big thing because there's always cost overrides or overages. Um, these machines are very expensive to, to not only purchase, but to maintain. Um, and they require service contracts that can be uh, kind, kind of surprising if, you, if you're caught unaware. Um, and then the materials can often have a, a very high uh, uh, handling cost, uh, especially mm -hmm. if you're looking at powdered reactive alloys. And that was something that we learned working with CCAT. Steels are, are one thing. Steels that have high chromium, now that's a health challenge, as Gene noted. Uh, if we start looking at coppers and, and nickel alloys, it's not too bad, but then when you start crossing the threshold into aluminums or titaniums and some of the higher nickel alloys like Inconels, it can get a little bit dangerous because some of these materials can become explosive. Um, so uh, do your do your research and due diligence first. <laughs> Excellently stated. Um, so if a company is interested in working with the BIC and um, and the BSS Additive Group or any of the the people that you know were on presentations today, what would the process be? How how do they get engaged? Well, I would encourage them to to consider applying in through a demo program uh, through Nerdic. Um, simply because I, I think that the strength of the group uh, is in its size. Um, obviously, we're working as a multi-state operation that uh, can contribute uh, insights from everything from large format additive manufacturing that's being used up in Maine to develop boats and wind turbine potential and uh, aerospace experience that, that the CCAT uh, group has 
Uh, mm -hmm. The BIC is relatively new, but we do have a different mix of uh, technologies here. And just up the street, we have companies like General Dynamics that are feeding into this conversation daily. So applying through CDA, through Nerdic, and, and that'll you know that'll get us uh, all kind of partnering together to, to help help you figure out what, where it fits best. Okay, um, and I guess a question I have is um, how can I access the benchmarking, you know, data that you have, the files that you're creating, and and make use of that information? That's how we're going to again uh, uh, work through Nerdic. We're going to be uh, working with CCAT to make sure that those those benchmarking files will be available. Uh, but again, we'd like to encourage people to to tie in uh, not just as a download so that it becomes yet another benchy that two million people print. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'd like to be able to have it uh, a, a little bit more controlled so that uh, that data can find its best use within both the region and, and internationally um, to serve the people that, that we need to help support. All right. Thank you. I guess we'll turn it back over to you, Ron. I know we're starting to run short on time. No, Jeff, I think you're going to stay on for a moment. But Steve, yep. you know, I did want to just segue in and, and I was going to just introduce Eileen. Eileen Candles has been the one kind of masterminding this whole program usually behind the scenes. So it's really a pleasure to have Eileen on because she's the one that's been making all this stuff come together and coordinating. But, you know, Steve, you brought up, it just goes all the way back to Patricia's uh, comments early on um, about this, this system that's been built, this ecosystem. And as you said, look, these companies, one of the, first of all, the, the, the most inexpensive way and the impactful way for them to get involved is to sign up for these demonstration projects. And then, Steve, you also just slightly mentioned quickly electric boat, but you look at the fact that you've got the major global industrial companies, you've got the supply chain, you've got the technology centers, you've got the MEPs and all their resources. I mean, mm -hmm. you couldn't have, you couldn't lay this out in a in a more simple way. And again, you know, Eileen's the one pulling all the strings behind that curtain over there, making all this, getting us all together. Mm -hmm. So I just thought that was an important point that hopefully our audience knows and we can be broadcasting out. Yeah. Patricia, anything else on your end? Just hearing Steve the way he kind of wrapped that up. Right, you know, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I, I'm just like amazed and a little bit overwhelmed every time I hear uh, an additive manufacturing presentation and, you know, learning today that cold spray is an additive technology, for example, and about the, the, the Benchy.com and, you know, it's just, um, yeah, yeah. I, it was an excellent presentation, and there's just so much uh, to learn. And thank you, Steve, for also bringing up the industrial skills base, right, and the importance of the educational component with this as well. It's uh, it's, it's fascinating. Right. Well, thank you for everyone. Really appreciate mm -hmm. your participation. I know we got just a couple of minutes, so Eileen is actually going to be kind of wrapping up a little bit about the demonstration projects and last little bit info. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ron and Patricia, for your comments leading me into this discussion about the pilot demonstration projects. And Steve, fabulous presentation. And again, you pointed us to the direction of a lot of possibilities to consider with companies who are going to apply. So at the bottom of the screen now, if you'd like to apply for one of our demonstration pilots, there's a number of them that we have opened. They are free to you. And you will have access to the services of a number of different companies and organizations that CCAT is helping bring to you through the Nerdic funding. So um, you can go to the next slide, Donna. And on here, you can see we are looking for a number of companies to apply for the generative design part optimization. For this particular discussion today, two out of six of the parts that are provided to us in the pilot applications will be selected for manufacturing using the Berkshire Innovation Center's additive technologies. And as a reference there, if the design is too big, it will be scaled down, a scaled version will be printed instead. Mm -hmm. So applications for this are open and accepted through May 28th. We really encourage you to apply. And Jeff, did you wanna add a bigger picture here? No, here again, uh, I would encourage if you're a company that's interested in does the additive make sense or you're doing it now and you want to expand what you're doing, uh, this is a fantastic opportunity to, uh, um, you know, try some things out and explore additive uh, at no cost. And uh, it's a great opportunity. 
Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So with the next slide, um, I'll give you a comment that next week we will have our last May presentation. It will be a 90 minute presentation, which is different from the others. And it will be delivered by Dr. Brett Ellis, who's the associate professor at the Center for Additive Manufacturing of Metals, University of Maine together with John Belding, director of the Advanced Manufacturing Center and the co-director of the Center for Additive Manufacturing of Metals at the University of Maine, together with, from the Vermont Technical College, Christopher Polk. So that will be next week. And then the next slide will speak to a couple of the workshops following. The first will be in early June, June 8th, will be RAM Engineering Reviewing MBD, Model-Based Definition, how it helps design and manufacturing processes, how it is the basis of digital thread as it relates to a company's digital transformation. And then on June 15th, Machine Tool Probing with CCAT in partnership with Renishaw. They'll be discussing machine tool probing, what it is, how it can help you maximize efficiency, quality, capability and accuracy of machine tools. And then beginning shortly after that, at the end of June, we will have our next series or the end of our series will be the presentations of these demonstration technology pilots. So we've introduced a number of them. We have three more introductory workshops coming up as I just shared, but then we'll have a series of seven technology demonstrations where we'll be bringing to you those companies who have had us um, apply some technology, some of these advanced industry 4.0 technologies to their product, to their needs, and discuss how the outcome was. What were the results? What was the impact? And where are they gonna head from here? So we'll be looking forward to your participation in that and hope that you'll bring in more organizations across the New England supply, uh, defense supply chain community to take advantage of these. And next slide so, really gives you um, Nasir Manon, who is our principal investigator at CCAT. This provides his contact information, and he was unfortunately unable to join us today. But thank you to all my partners here for helping me um, with this presentation and all of the others already. Steve and Jean and Mark, thank you again for all of your work as presenters for us. So with that, I think it's a wrap and we hope to see you in another week. Thank you. Thank you everyone, Thank you. have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.